Welcome to the Assembling Inclusion podcast. On this show, we feature different programs, individuals, and initiatives focused on being more inclusive of individual needs. We invite you to learn right alongside us. If you want some additional resources or access to our courses, please visit our website or follow us on social media. But for right now, let's get right to the episode. Coming up next on the Assembly Inclusion Podcast. And the way to do that is to reach out into the community of deaf and disabled artists. Invite them in. Invite them to a performance. How can we make this performance accessible for you? And then look at your stage. Is your stage actually accessible? So start there, but start by actually going to the community. Today, we are focusing on disability inclusion within theater. Queens Theater, which is located in Queens, New York, has developed a program called Theater for All. This program focuses on the intentional inclusivity for both audience members and performers on the stage. They make an intentional effort to work with artists and performers within the disability community. We talked to Mary Teresa Archbold all about theater and performance inclusivity and how the Theater for All program offers different options from performance support to work and advocacy. So let's dive right in to learn more. Hello and welcome back to the Assembly Inclusion podcast. I'm here today with Mary Teresa Archbold, who is part of the Theater for All inclusive program at Queens Theater. So thank you for joining us today, Mary. Oh, thank you, Katie. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to have you. Just to start off, can you just explain the mission behind the Theater for All program for those who may not be familiar with it? One of the things that we at Queen's Theatre decided years ago was that we needed to do better and be intentional about being inclusive and what does inclusive include, right? One of the things that we found was that so many theatres were doing so much work about really being accessible for their audiences, really making sure that there's caption performance, sensory performance, doing all the right things. And one of the missing pieces was the stage itself did not reflect true, equitable, diverse landscape of our society. And one of the things that it made it an intention of was to make sure that we started to see some deaf and disabled artists on the stage, as opposed to just in the audience. And Theater for All training program was born out of that because One of the things that we discovered in talking with so many deaf and disabled artists is that so many training programs were not accessible to the point where they just felt discouraged. So why pursue it? So Queens Theater took the bold step to say, you know what, we're going to create it. And so we're entering our fifth year of the Theater for All training, where we provide training in voice, scene study, on camera, movement, all facets of performance for a two-week intensive, completely free of charge for the participants. That's really exciting. I didn't realize it had been five years already. That's a really long time. When I was looking up different programs, I really wanted to find something related to theater because I hadn't covered theater yet. And... I had seen a lot of, like you said, like making it accessible as an audience member, but I was really drawn to your organization because of the fact that you were putting people on the stage and it was a stage actor centered focus and there there wasn't really anybody doing that. So that's really great that you all took that step to move forward in that way. So I want to talk about the Theater for All Actor Training Program itself. You said it's two weeks. Can you explain how that kind of looks? Our program, and it has grown, I'm happy to say, we started the first couple of years in person. ah, And then, you know, as we all do, it has had to shift to online, which has wound up being a surprising win for us because of our program, which is two weeks. There are two classes a day, two to three hour classes where in the morning you'll do scene study work. And in the afternoon, you'll study voice. and Throughout the week, you'll study four different classes. And then the second week, you do the same thing. And it culminates in a performance because that is crucial to any actor's skill development is because they need to perform. That's where you learn. Get in front of the audience and see how it lands. See what happens to your nerves, all of that. So 
the way that we structure the program now, there's actually three levels, entry level, which is for those that are curious, that are beginning, that are thinking, I would love to be an actor or even just try on some of those skills. That's the beginner level. And we offer different courses for that. Then we have the early career level, which is folks who've had a little bit of experience, some training. And so the level is a little bit higher. And then finally, our other level is called working professional. And these are artists with disabilities who are out there working, they're represented, that are showing up on your television, on your stages, who are there to dive deeper and be in community with one another. Because oftentimes, deaf and disabled artists are in silos by themselves. And one of the wonderful things that I love about this training program is that we also talk about advocacy. Often the narrative that deaf and disabled artists get is be quiet, keep your head down, don't make it hard to work with you. So they don't advocate for themselves to say, this is actually what I need in order to do my job. And we have panels and discussions where we rehearse scripts. So Folks get used to saying the words and making sure they're really clear of what they need for themselves. Because as you know, disability is not all the same. It's so unique. It's so personal. And so if we give actors the acting tools, the skills, and then the words to empower them to stand up and say, this is great. I'm excited for this opportunity. And I need you to provide these accessible services. That is our ultimate goal. And we've had it work. That's what folks are doing. They're out building their careers, which is so exciting. That's really great that you have that self-advocacy piece built in, because I think that's huge. In addition to just teaching up the skills, I think that's something that I consistently hear over and over is that the advocacy piece in any kind of inclusion initiative is really necessary and crucial. So that's great that it's been so successful too for the actors who are out there working and they're able to advocate for their needs. One of the things I had noticed on your website was that when you started the program, you formed an advisory panel. So I'm assuming that probably contributed right to kind of that advocacy as well. Absolutely. The board was really the first step. And Queen's Theater did a marvelous job of assembling the board. I'm happy to say that I was on that first board and have been with the program for all five years and now stepping into the program manager role. When we assembled the board, it was really intentional and really thoughtful, which I loved. It wasn't, who's interested? So only the loud voices that we always hear over and over get involved. No, they went for a 360 point of view. We had academics who are talking about inclusionary teaching practices. We had working artists who identify as deaf or disabled. We had just true teaching artists. We had a wide array, we had directors, writers, all sorts of performers who are in there. And one of the first things that we did was we talked. We just talked about what is the landscape looking like and what are the frustrations? What are those points? And the biggest part that made me so excited to be a part of the board is that they stopped talking about it and did something about it. They took action. And through that conversation, that's where Theater for All intensive came from because we needed to provide that training that folks were being closed out of on the university levels, out of high school level theater productions because the stage is not accessible. There were so many barriers and Queens Theater is a fully accessible space. So we figured let's just do it here and do it now and bring in the folks here so that they are ready to go out all across the country and work. I love that you had said the board was intentionally selected. There's so many cases of people just being like, yeah, okay, like, let's just pull some people together. But I like that it was deliberate and like who was selected and how the voices were represented, which is really important. If an actor wanted to get involved in the program, how do they go about doing it? Is there like an application process? I'm sure there's a large variety of people who probably want to be involved in such a great program. Yes, there is an application process. Right now, the application process, depending on the level, if you're a beginner, all we ask is just a a photo and sort of a letter of interest of what you hope to gain out of the program. If you're early career or working professional, we do actually ask for an audition. 
very low stakes, you know, just put yourself on camera and submit it just so that we can see you because so much of what we do, we need to actually see you and your work and your artistry. And then we place you into the different levels from there. And then from that, people show up and start to dig in together. And one of the things that we definitely also do in the workshops are those panels that further the conversation to make sure was self-taping hard? How can we assist? How can we help you set up something so that next time you're called to audition, it's easier for you? Because I can say as a working actor myself right now, 99% of my auditions happen in my living room because self-tape is the way to go. And so Queen's Theater about a year and a half ago stepped up and created a webinar that showed people with disabilities, this is how you can self-tape. This is how you can set yourself up for success to be considered at that upper echelon. Well, that's really great. What other types of panels do they typically have? So that's where a lot of our advocacy work and talking about that, all sorts of things. And one of the big things that we also talk about in the panels that I love so, so much is we listen to each other. What are the stories? What are the challenges we face? What do we say when someone discriminates, right? And we deal with sort of the psychological as well as the practical side of it. And then one of the fun things about the panels is that we get to really talk about taboo topics that only other artists with disabilities will talk about because so many times folks are so open to it, but they feel uncomfortable. And in this community, in this space, people are like, oh, yes. And then my leg fell off. Ah! It's a place to truly show up authentically. Part of one of the things that we're starting to do is also use some of these to open up other opportunities to talk about in the arts, whether it's directing, stage management, design, playwriting. All of those panels are to shed light on other opportunities that there are that maybe the stage is exciting to you, but thinking maybe I don't want to be on the stage, but I love the theater. There are so many avenues and that's an area that theater for all is growing into. We're going to start to expand beyond just actor training. We're going to have master classes in directing and playwriting and stage management so that we can really start to grow a full cultural force of deaf and disabled artists ready to go. That's really great that the panels are giving such a safe space to come together and share and talk and share experiences. I'm sure that has to be beneficial for everybody who's been involved in the program. So I wanted to ask, I'm sure there are many, but what are the biggest successes of the training program do you think so far? I will say one of the biggest successes has truly been community and the collaborations that have happened after. There are folks who have met through TFA and are now making short films together. Rachel Handler, one of our artists, has led the force and worked with several of our artists with disabilities in the Easter Seals Film Festival. The other thing that has come out that surprised us was truly brainstorming through use of social media and our Facebook groups that are for members only. I'm running into this situation. What are your thoughts? And that sort of community that goes into there. That said, there are other artists that have gone on to appear in Netflix series. Queen's Theater itself cast a Carrie Cox, a disabled artist, in the lead in Barefoot in the Park, where it's so exciting because thinking beyond roles that signify as disabled, to put an actor with a disability in a role that is just human, which is the goal right? Because we are all just humans. Also, this wonderful artist that we had with us early on in the program, Peter Trolick, who has now gone on to become a performer with the Full Radius Dance Company, which is an integrated dance company. It's so exciting to see people's names start to pop up all over. And so many of them still come back to the community for support and come back to say, I want to build this project. Who's with me? I love that sense of community. That's really wonderful that even after the two weeks are finished, you still have access to people who have been through it in the past 
who are going through it now who can collaborate and work together. I can see how that would be something that would be amazing. In addition to obviously the actors who are have gone on to do performances, but that's just great to have that community base to go back to. So I saw online, and this is jumping around a little bit, that if it goes back in 2019, pre-pandemic, you had hosted the first national disability in theater convening. I wanted to know a little bit about that. What types of discussions were there? That convening also came out of conversations with the, the TFA board, because even as we were gathering, we wanted to go beyond New York to make sure that this work is being done everywhere. And that's the thing, it was being done everywhere and everyone was doing it themselves. And again, so many theaters are trying to be intentional and inclusive and really do the work and they needed support. So that convening, which happened in 2019, brought over 150 theater professionals, policymakers, cultural leaders, influencers, and funders (laughs) together to discuss Where are we with American theater when it comes to disability inclusion? Let's be honest, where are we? And one of the things that came out, we had so many different discussions that focused around new play development. So often, and I'm a parent, I have kids in school, and there's such a movement for authentic voice representation in the books that they're reading and what they're seeing. And we want to make sure disability is part of that, that there is authentic voice creation happening in our new plays around education. Where are we going? We're not just thinking about now, what is the future? And I'm happy to say Theater for All has a Theater for All Children program and a Theater for All Teen Academy that we have developed as well to make sure that we're starting younger, get them younger into the theater. And that came out of that. One of the biggest things that happened is that all these theater executives, I mean, we had folks from Seattle, from Minnesota, from North Carolina, all these folks came together and they really developed models of how we are going to do this and what are the steps we're taking to make sure that our theaters are accessible for yes, patrons, but being intentional that our stages reflect that as well. It sounds like it was a really great collaborative event then. And I didn't know there was a children's and a teen part of the program too. I was only looking at the adult section. I didn't realize that Theater for All had developed a younger program. Is that for students that are in schools? Yes. Specifically in schools, certain schools, or do they have to apply into? One of the things, and I'm happy to say that I am actually the lead instructor on Theater for All Children. I have been a teaching artist forever. And I love it because there is no greater sense of group of folks to work with than kids because they'll tell you what they think. But Theater for All Children, we started really going into what we call here in New York City, District 75, which is special education. Going into those schools saying, all right, we're here. How do we want to do this? And Theater for All, of course, didn't just take the model of like throw a teacher in there and create some theater. We wanted to get even more intentional about it. So the first year we worked with an inclusive classroom. So it was a real mix of kids that were going there and they developed their own (laughs) version of Lysistrata. Because of course, that's what you go back to the Greeks, right? But this was a bunch of middle school inclusive classroom that developed this. So that worked really well. And what I loved about it is we learned of how to amplify the voices of the students who identify as having disabilities, intellectual, physical, anything. And then the next year we got more creative and we decided we were gonna do a full year long program where we push into the classroom. But for the first half of the year, we work only with the special ed classroom. And in the back half of the year, we integrate it with a gen ed classroom. This is a model that my teaching partner, Jamie Patron and I have come up with that we are so excited about because what happens in the back half of the year, the students with the disabilities lead, not follow, because they are familiar with the exercises. They know how this is gonna work. They've already created a play. And so now we're going to go through and create a play and they're going to help these gen ed kids get up to speed. And that for us has been so incredible. And to see 
a true blending of creative minds of two classrooms that don't touch. They might share the same building, but these classrooms never touch each other. And that has been such a win because the teachers say to see the kids greet each other in the hallway in a way that they never would have before. That to me is the actual win, is that community and demystifying what happens in a special ed classroom for gen ed kids has been so great because to see them work in these small groups and listen to the ideas, everyone's like, yes, yes, yes. It's truly the gift that I'm getting emotional, even just thinking about it. The gifts are so surprising and so deep to see them hug and high five each other, even virtually high five each other. It's been amazing. That's wonderful. And that resonates with me because my background was in special education. So there was always that separation. And I love that it's the groups coming together and really collaborating. That really speaks to me. It makes me think, Katie, because I was actually, when I was looking at your background, I love also that you worked with that transition time of folks, which I love. We have a lot of those folks who come into the TFA program looking to just have new experiences. And what shocked me and why I love Theater for All Children is these 18 to 21 year olds were going through this, they had never been exposed to theater. They never got the opportunity to have theater classes, to have that arts enrichment. And that needs to change immediately. And this past summer, I was so excited. Our home district here in Queens, District 30, got summer school funding and we're like, yay, Let's bring a whole mess of theater programming to District 75 kids. So this past summer, we were in the three hub schools. We served over 400 students with a theater and puppetry program so that they were exposed to something creative and fun in this small way, hopefully opening the door to more inclusionary practices around theater in special education. I know firsthand that like, that was always the first thing to go when a student had an IEP. It was always like, we need to make room for the extra reading and the extra math class and you can't have an elective anymore. So they missed the exposure to like any kind of arts, which a lot of my students I remember were so, like they were very gifted musicians and they were missing out on those opportunities in favor of academics. And I'm like, that's, they need to have exposure to other things too, to be creative, to, you know, release that type of energy. So that's amazing that you had that summer program available for the students. I'm sure that was beneficial for them. I hope so. (laughs) It was really (laughs) fun and cute. I loved it. I wanted to ask about, I read on your website that in the past, there was like short plays that were produced that were specifically written by disabled playwrights. Is that initiative still happening or is that something that happened pre-pandemic? I thought that was really interesting that you had mentioned earlier that there's a focus on directing and things like that for individuals who have a disability and I thought that was great that they were producing plays written by disabled playwrights. That is the whole thing. You know, there's the big movement, nothing about us without us. And so often, so many well-intentioned playwrights are writing for folks with disabilities as opposed to empowering disabled and deaf artists to write their stories. Coda is the perfect example that film that just really was like, hi, no, we're deaf, but we're just a family. (laughs) Like (laughs) We're showing the the reality of it. So one of the big things that has happened that I loved when we started doing the new play series, it gave the, the students of Theater for All the opportunity to put the chops into practice, to go into a rehearsal room. How do I navigate a play? How do I navigate my performance throughout a play? Because it's different than just a scene right? I have to sustain it, which is also something we have to be mindful of. Sustainable physical practices that protect yourself so that you're not hurting yourself. And one of the upsides of this initiative around new plays was getting directors in the room who boldly said, I want to work with actors with disabilities and I'm intimidated. I'm afraid to do it wrong. So I don't go there. So this was an opportunity to do a week-long workshop on a play where they too 
we're overcoming something and realizing, oh, okay, this is what it means to be inclusionary practice. How can I tweak what I'm doing to make sure that it is accessible? What language am I using that is really accessible? Because when we start to decode our language, wow, it becomes quite ableist real yes. quick. <laughs> <laughs> but that was one of the greatest things. And several of those short plays, some of these students have gone on to make short films of the plays that they wrote. And Queen's Theatre, I'm excited to say, is partnering with the Apothete, which is a disabled theater company, and the Lark in new play development so that we are getting more hands in there trying to make new works that are representative. And that to me is the most exciting because to see real stories told and not inspirational stories, which is the norm, as lovely as they all are, and they're great films, books, the reality could be a little bit different. <laughs> I was going to say, yes, yeah, it's not all happiness, inspiration all the time. So it's yeah. great to have those authentic voices telling the real stories. And it's great that there is an, an opportunity for them to be empowered to do that as well. You talk a little bit about some of the plans you have for expansion in the future for the program, but is there anything else like specifically that you're really looking forward to that you're going to get started doing? Absolutely. One of the things that we mentioned is that we are going beyond just acting. This spring, we hope to hold a winter intensive so that we are doing it more than once a year. We're also starting up master classes so that we can start to touch on directing and lighting design and scene design, where there are so many accessible points for artists with disabilities to come in. And so we're starting to open eyes to all the facets of a theatrical life and the, the theater culture. We are gonna to continue to expand theater for all children, theater for all teens, all of that's going to expand. And one of the biggest initiatives is that we are also raising money, of course, to make this happen. And one of our greatest early champions of this work is actor Vincent D'Onofrio, and who everyone knows, Daredevil, Law and Order, Criminal Intent. I, Please, I'm going to say Mystic Pizza because I loved him in <laughs> Mystic Pizza. He was so brilliant. One of the things that he has done, he was with us our very first year as our on-camera teacher. He himself has truly believes in mentoring and teaching and creating that true diverse landscape in theater. So he put his time where his mouth was and was in the room directing all of these folks. Have, he also has continued to stay in touch with them and support them. And this year he said, hey, we need to raise some more money. I'm giving you $15,000 of my own money as long as we match it. So if folks are inclined to donate a little bit, Vincent D'Onofrio will be matching the funds. And I can tell you, they all go to providing these resources free for deaf and disabled artists. That's really amazing. Do you have like a link to like where to donate? So I can put that in the show notes in case people are Absolutely. listening and they want to. Absolutely. Perfect. Then I'll make sure that's in the show notes to make sure everybody take a look at the description so you can make sure you, if you want to, you donate. And my last question for you is just based on your work with Theater for All, what advice would you give to just either whether it's like a community theater or a school district theater program, what advice would you give them to start the work toward becoming more inclusive? Oh, that's an awesome question because that's where it has to start. It has to start in communities of saying, no, this is what we want. And when that's identified, the first look I would make sure is that the space is accessible. And the way to do that is to reach out into the community of deaf and disabled artists, invite them in, invite them to a performance. How can we make this performance accessible for you? And then look at your stage. Is your stage actually accessible? So start there, but start by actually going to the community. Don't make an assumption about what you think is what they need. Ask them, invite them in. When they're in the conversation, I guarantee you, they're gonna open your eyes to things like, oh, I never really thought about that. And I never really thought that that's actually not accessible. And why are our wheelchair seats the worst sight lines <laughs> in the space, right? So. Really, my biggest thing would be, yes, open it up. And then when you do go into casting, cast that net 
reach out to Queens Theater. We have actors in so many communities. We have actors in Pittsburgh, in the South, like all over in the Southwest. Reach out to us. There are actors there who are hungry to work. We will connect you with them. The more that you start to invite them in, and that's the biggest thing, it's going to be intimidating. And I just want to say that to all the community theater producers, directors out there, it can feel intimidating because like so many, you don't want to do it wrong. I dare you be wrong, be wrong, say it wrong, do it wrong, but say it. And to the people who are deaf and disabled artists who will probably correct you and then smile and say, and I'm still happy to be here. I think that's great advice to just go out there and and try it and learn from getting it wrong. I think there was a lot of intimidation, even across the board, like at all the interviews I've done, people saying getting started is intimidating, but I like the advice of just start, just try and learn. And then at least you're getting started with being more inclusive. Absolutely. Um, So I just want to thank you so much, Mary Teresa, for joining us today and for talking all about Theater for All at the Queen's Theater. I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Thank you, Katie. This is so magical to be here because truly your podcast is so excited because it's people doing the work. And I think it's opening everyone's eyes that there are so many opportunities out there and to go out and take them, get involved, volunteer, do whatever, just get involved. That's the hope. (laughs) Thanks for listening to this episode of the Assembly Inclusion Podcast. I hope the information in this episode taught you something new, gave you a new idea, or showcased a new perspective. If you liked the episode, feel free to leave us a review or comment. If you have a recommendation for an individual or an organization who would make a great guest, you can message us on Twitter or Instagram or send us an email at assemblinginclusion at gmail.com. See you next time.